So I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Peter Lowen. And Peter is a PPS fellow and a professor in the Department of uh, Political Science and at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at uh, the University of Toronto. And he's going to uh, tell us a little bit about his latest edition of uh, the multi-year research project on public perception of changes in the labor market and the implications for policymakers. And this paper was actually just published earlier today. So I would encourage everyone to, to check it out. Uh, you'll get the inside scoop from Peter first. So uh, Peter, thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and over to you. Thanks very, very much, uh, Andre, for the for the invitation and for um, for PPF's ongoing um, um, support of my of my research and for PPF's engagement with this really important um, set of issues. Uh, I think we've got about 30 minutes on the dock. So what I want to do is just spend maybe seven or eight, just giving you a sense of some of the things that we're seeing in our in our data. And I'll tell you that the data I'm going to present to you come from surveys that we did among Canadians in the spring of 2019, 2020 and 2021. And if you think about that period of time, it's really a remarkable one for a couple of reasons. One is that the pandemic falls square in the middle of that. But the second is that there are two other things going on at the same time. One is that we were seeing, um, and the related things actually, one is that we're seeing uh, a real acceleration in the application of automation and artificial intelligence, AI, on um, uh, in various industries and in a wider swath of industries maybe than ever before. And the second is, is that, um, um, despite the kind of pressure relief valve of, of the US election in, in 2020, um, we've still had this rising tide and pressure of, of populism um, in various forms uh, around the world. So the research project we've been engaged in has been trying to look at all three of these factors together and understand the extent to which, for example, the disruption caused by AI, the disruption caused by the pandemic, and maybe the interaction of those, maybe changing people's preferences about what they want government to do and changing their perceptions about what the world looks like for them going forward from the perspective of labor markets. So let me just take the great risk of sharing my screen, see if I can do this properly, and I'll walk you through a few, a few slides um, in a deck. Uh, Andre, can you tell me if you can see those? Perfect, great, thanks very much. So I'm gonna go to the next slide here, uh, and you can see that as well. Then we're good to go, great. So I think as I've, as I've articulated, the real pressure here is that we have two big labor market disruptions going on at once. The technological revolution that's underwritten by automation and AI, and then the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And you know, McKinsey and others have noted that the, the acceleration of AI applications um, has been endogenous to the COVID pandemic, that the pandemic has created incentives for corporations to really rush headlong into automation. So not only do we have this massive labor disruption that comes from essentially shutting down whole sectors of our economy, opening them up, shutting them down, opening them up like we've been doing, but we have layered on top of that the idea that some companies are actually going to move away from bringing people back in the rates they did, or they're going to bring them back into roles that are different than, different than the ones that they were in um, before. If you look at how Canadians feel about this, and this is important, um, it looks to us like the following. Essentially, Canadians two years into our surveying, so looking from 2019 to 2021 and 2020 to 2021, have a more acute sense that they're not ready for the future. And that sense is more acute than it was um, in years in years prior. And I'll just point you to this, this figure. And when we ask people to agree or disagree with the statement that I feel I have the skills necessary to maintain my standard of living in the current economy. Again, these are Canadians a representative sample of them surveyed in each of these years, we find that nearly one in five Canadians strongly disagree with that statement in 2021 and one in 10. So near on near on 30% of Canadians are telling us that they they disagree with the idea that they feel that they have the skills necessary to uh, maintain their standard of living in the current economy, let alone the future one. Um, and more of them are uncertain now than they were in, in, uh, in 2020. Something has happened which has changed Canadians, it's doubled really their assessment of whether they are ready um, for, the, for the future. And there's a lot more of this in our, in our paper that's just come out, which I encourage you to, to read and to send comments and questions. Importantly, what we're interested in understanding is not only how Canadians feel about this, but what responses they want governments to take um, in, in response to these types of disruptions. And I don't want to kind of pass normative judgment on what kinds of responses are good or bad, but I think that we can recognize that governments have um, have incentives to 
respond sometimes in ways that are positive in terms of uh, from a policy perspective, and sometimes in ways that are reactive or are politically motivated, but perhaps aren't the best policy options. So one way we get at this, um, for example, is, um, is we ask people what they think government should do to corporations who automate away jobs. And here's just some idea of the attitudes that we're finding among Canadians. Almost four in 10 tell us that they think the government should punish corporations that reduce their workforces via automation or AI. Almost half tell us they think consumers should boycott companies engaged in these practices. And again, almost half think that companies should continue to employ workers even when technology could do their job more effectively. You have the basis here for a real um, opposition to the things that would actually improve the productivity of the economy if being uh, dislocating in the short term. Um, we do something else where we, where we, um, uh, we tell respondents about what automation may do to jobs. And then we ask them, we tell them, you know, automation, artificial intelligence are going to take away a large number of jobs. So the federal government should. And we ask them to agree or disagree with a, with a policy action. And what you can see here is we gave them one of three different policy actions, randomized them into it. And the story is that some of these policy actions are, are good, like spending more on STEM for university education. Some are, are, I think, personally are objectionable, things like decreasing skilled worker immigration or decreasing unskilled worker immigration. But what you see from the figure is the following is that all of those policy options are more supported now in 2021 than they were in 2020, than they were in, uh, in 2019. Now, people like the more positive one of STEM education, but you can see that support, for example, of government decreasing immigration, skilled or unskilled, is markedly higher in 2021 than it was in 2019 um, or 2020. In 2021, Canadians are more eager for policy action across the board from governments. When you look at in our sample from 2021 and from 2020 among those who have lost jobs or lost income due to COVID, what you find is that actually support for these policy actions, good and bad, are higher among those individuals, that the ones, people who have lost their job due to COVID are more supportive of government just decreasing skilled immigration, decreasing unskilled immigration. They're not more supportive, by the way, of government putting more into um, into STEM. So there's a concern here, right, an underlying concern that not only is there the basis for a populist response to automation and AI, but it's actually accelerated by those who have been given the short shrift by um, COVID-19. Just two more things I'll walk you through. We did a recent experiment, which, which is, comes out of the, 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 the following counterfactual. We'll shift gears just, just a little bit here, but it comes out of the following counterfactual. Suppose the government in exchange for CERB and the other income supports that it created, asked Canadians to engage in self-improvement. That it has simply said, look, there's lots of ways that you can learn stuff while you're um, temporarily out of work. You can sign up for Khan Academy. You can maybe sign up for an online course at U of T or Khan of College or, or, or somewhere else. And you can imagine government doing some of that in exchange for people receiving CERB. And what's the counterfactual? If government had done that, how much support would there have been for that? So we did a, a recently just a, a little experiment in which we asked people um, whether they would accept a voucher to take a university course. The government gave them a voucher to take any university course, would they do it? And perhaps it's cheap talk, but what we find is that if you look at those who are not impacted by COVID, 63% of them tell us, yeah, well, I would take the voucher, right? Now, if you look at those who lost income or lost their job, three quarters of them are ready to take that voucher when they're given this hypothetical situation to improve themselves. The counterfactual here is what if we had used this, this slowdown, this, this unfortunate kind of lockdown we had to go into or a series of lockdowns and gave people a shot you know, in the arm to go out and do a little bit of self-improvement for themselves. And what if we had done this in a way where we properly incentivize universities to actually provide those services in a way that are you know, not hampered or easily accessible, don't require long application cycles are available um, on demand. The other one is um, we just did one more experiment with micro training in which we asked people whether they would take a two hour course and how to administer CPR in exchange for um, $100. Now, CPR is a, it's a quite a good thing to know, it turns out. Uh, it's also re a requirement for um, lots of different types of types of jobs. We did other tests here where we swapped in other courses. They received the same amount of support. But overall, the results here are pretty are pretty clear, right? That if, if the government's offering to pay people a small amount to get micro credential, overwhelmingly people will um, agree to do it. And that support is higher among those who have lost income, particularly those who lost their jobs via COVID. So what I just wanna kind of 
lay out here at the top line is this, is that there's a lot of disruption, there's a lot of uncertainty roiling through our economy and through our society right now. There's a lot of responses that people can be sold convincingly by government to address this, but there are a whole series of positive actions we could be taking to do the types of things that have been on the lips of people for a long time around micro-credentialing and training and reskilling. And there's more appetite for those now as a result of this pandemic than there has been before. We've lost 18 months of opportunity to do it. No reason why it should keep us from doing it um, in the future. I'll stop there, Andre, and I look forward to the questions. Someone was bound to forget to unmute themselves today, right? <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that, Peter. Really appreciate your insights and uh, look forward to uh, your, your blogs that are coming out, presenting some of that additional data uh, really soon. Um, I want to open the floor up to questions from the audience. You've given us so much to chew on. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, so please keep those coming through the Q&A, folks. But uh, to kick things off, I want to uh, give the floor over to one audience member in particular who uh, had some research uh, released today as well that is particularly relevant. Uh, Mark Frenette, Mark Frenette uh, from SatsCan, if you uh, are on the line now, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and, and let us know what you're thinking, how this kind of jives with the findings that, that you found through your own research? Yeah, thank you, Andre. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear yep. you. Okay, great. I think you can't see me, however. But... That's right. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I was very happy actually to have an opportunity to talk uh, briefly about our study because I, I actually saw the first iteration of Peter's work about three years ago at a Brave New Work uh, conference or the lead up to it. I had a, a, a first look at, at the, uh, the work. Uh, so I'm happy to see that that work is continuing. So the study that we released today at Statistics Canada uh, between myself and my co-author, René Morissette, uh, really complements uh, the work that Peter's doing. And it looks at job security in the age of artificial intelligence and potential pandemics. So the way that we measure, I'm gonna be very brief here uh, on the methods, but the way that we measure uh, job security traditionally is to simply ask if people have a permanent job or do they have a fixed end date to their job? Is it a casual, a contract job, seasonal job, or so forth. This obviously does not account for these two new realities. So we developed a measure of what we call triple job protection. One that is a permanent job measured in the traditional sense, and also uh, faces a low risk of automation. And thirdly is resilient to pandemics. Now being resilient to pandemics in, in this uh, uh, method that we use is defined as one of three uh, characteristics. So your job is teleworkable, you can do it at home, or if you have to do it at the traditional workplace, there is sufficient distance between yourself and your coworkers, as well as the general public that you're serving, or the job is an essential job. Okay. So what we find actually is that two in five workers have a triple protected job. So that's a fairly reasonable amount, but really the most interesting part of the study is the variability in this rate of triple protected job holding across socioeconomic characteristics. And the results are quite striking. Uh, if we look at couples, for example, dual earner couples who are in the top 10% of the earnings distribution, they are actually 20 times more likely to both, both, the, both spouses hold a triple protected job than dual earner couples in the bottom 10%. So let that sink in, that's 77% at the top. Both members of the couple have a triple protected job versus 3.5% in the bottom 10% of the earnings distribution. And education is a big factor. We see similar results across the education spectrum. The higher educated you are, the more likely you are to have a triple protected job. And there was also a fair bit of variability across the geographic spectrum. If you're in a larger city, you're much more likely uh, to have triple protected jobs. Ottawa ranked first, actually not surprising given that the public service is here as well as uh, the high tech sector, but other large cities were not far behind, Toronto, Montreal, for example. And uh, far behind were uh, smaller communities in rural uh, Newfoundland, rural uh, Saskatchewan and other smaller communities. So taken together, these results really uh, shed light on 
potential new drivers of family income inequality uh, in the future through uh, the potential for uh, more variability and job security across socioeconomic uh, characteristics than we've seen in the past, uh, given uh, you know, uh, uh, what we expect in terms of uh, 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 increases in automation in the workplace and the potential for future pandemics. So I'll stop there. Uh, and you know, if anybody has any questions or if Peter, if you wanted to, uh, to jump in on that, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts. Thanks, I appreciate you sharing some of your findings with us, Mark. And we've uh, we've shared the link to your uh, research in the chat so people can can uh, take a look. But I'm curious, Peter, what you make of uh, some of those findings and especially with the, how they jive, you know, we're seeing we're seeing kind of Mark's perspective on the reality and, and the risks, the, the real risks that people are facing, whereas you kind of took a look at what people perceive the risks to be. And I'm curious to see how you how you see those two things meshing. Yeah, I think it's well. I'd say a couple of, a couple of things. It's I mean, remarkably interesting and important important research, and a couple of more substantive substantive comments. Um, the first is that uh, in our in our first report we did a couple of years ago, you know, we 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 took the kind of McKinsey skills based approach of figuring out how much exposure a person had to automation based on the the complement of tasks which they did, because we all have some exposure to it, right, for good and bad, um, and I think that. When we looked at, as I recall, when we looked at that and, and kind of correlated with people's perceptions of their own vulnerability, there's really no relationship. People just don't have a sense of, of how vulnerable their jobs actually are, right? So what, what's interesting here to me is that, is that, you know, I think what the pandemic has made clear to people is that the conditions of that vulnerability are now clearer than they were before. People do know whether they could telework. I mean, I imagine Mark could have respondents who could self-assess themselves into this. People do know if they can telework. They know if they're essential. Um, they know if they can do their job in a, in a socially distanced way. So whether this kind of heightens people's sense of correct sense of vulnerability and actually leads them to demand more concrete action is a really interesting question to me. The second is, is I just want to underline how important those findings are about is um, in this in this country um, and if you're worried like if you're worried like I am frankly just about the capacity of the state to maintain people's basic levels of trust and it's in its protection of them right for their continued consent of the state it's really clear here right that we have an economy which could not do two things at once it could not it could not have lower income essential workers working and by essential workers, I mean, people who we actually needed for our day-to-day -day life, not just healthcare workers, but factory workers, delivery drivers and limo drivers at the airport um, and teachers, um, but that we couldn't actually have, we couldn't have essential workers working and protect them at the same time, at the same rate that we were protecting other people. And I think that's a very, very damaging thing, idea once it sinks into people's, once it sinks into people's heads. And Mark's data supports this kind of notion that we really can't have both, right? We've got, if you've got 4% of people in the lowest 10% who are triply protected against a pandemic, that's a very, very dangerous situation for us to, uh, to be in. And there's just, a, 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 I think, a very, a very worrisome undercurrent of, 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 uh, of attitudes there. Thanks, Peter. And thanks so much, Mark, for, uh, for sharing that with us as well. I, I want to have an opportunity now to, to go to a few other questions. Uh, from the audience, and, and a great one just came in here, uh, Peter, interrogating a little bit more uh, your your takeaways from the paper and uh, especially some of the recommendations. So the, the question was about, um, you know, what specifically government can do to try and preempt or, uh, or, or, or avoid um, the kind of rise in populism that you're saying, you know, has taken place in other places and uh, could be one of the risks here in Canada, and especially as that relates to anti-immigrant um, sentiment, are, are there kind of particular things that you would envision um, happening or, or would hope would happen kind of preemptively? Yeah, so so the, this just goes back to a kind of perennial question about whether we're, we're lucky or whether we're good as a, as a country. Why is it that we've been spared the kind of anti-immigrant politics that other countries have, have had? And if, and if, if people think the whispers of it that we've had are of a kind with other countries, they're just not. We've we we we've we've by some fortune have been spared by that, and it's, it has a lot to do with the pop, with our population composition and a lot to do with electoral geography. But mm -hmm. I don't worry about the anti-immigration um, element of it. I do worry about this underlying sense that that government is being 
is being pernicious towards people or being arbitrary towards them. Mm -hmm. And what we really have to have, I, this is my sense, is it is it is that the pandemic has opened up an opportunity for people to see what happens when government is seized by and animated by the issues that matter to them. Mm. So what we need to have is governments that continue to figure out what actually are the animating driving issues, what are the, the issues that underwrite the fears of citizens, and to speak to them directly. And for me, there's an opportunity there, but just by my lights, that, that one way to stave off populism is to just speak directly to what people's concerns are and to acknowledge them, to follow that old adage, right, that populists ask the right questions but have the wrong answers, and to say that if people have deep concerns about labor markets, if they have deep concerns about their capacity to operate in this economy and in future economies and secure the, 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 the well-being of their children, to get into a house, which is going to be the next big, big set of issues um, uh, uh, in, the, in, in the next few years, mm -hmm. government needs to speak to that directly and have concrete things that can get there and it needs to get creative. What I hope it can do is take some lessons about how rapidly it's been able to change its way of doing things through the mm -hmm. pandemic mm -hmm. and apply some of those to these policy areas. So things like mm -hmm. thinking about skills training more seriously, right? Thinking about income supports to people who are due to exogenous factors put her to work and to mm -hmm. take this dynamism that we've had over the last 18 months and government's been as dynamic as business has been to take mm -hmm. the dynamism and 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 put it into kind of into policy action. Yeah, and are you optimistic about uh, our ability to to do that to keep the momentum up? No, I'm not. Unfortunately, uh, to be to be, I, I mean, I, I'm not. I think this is for a couple of reasons, right? One is that this is this has surely been exhausting for governments, and fairly so. You know, I don't. You know, when you talk to talk to deputy ministers, you talk to cabinet ministers. This is it's been flat out for eighteen months, right? So, mm -hmm. so. You know, so I think we've got to recognize that they're that they're that they're tired in this, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing is that the missed opportunities here are that we didn't use this to break down some of the artificial arbitrary barriers we've got around federalism, around areas of responsibility that maybe would have given us a bit of practice about how we could do this kind of more constructively into the future. So just mm -hmm. here's a here's a counterfactual which I love to entertain. Imagine that the federal government in the spring of 2020, when there was real uncertainty about what was going to happen with re-enrollment rates at universities. I'm I'm self-interested. I'm a professor, but imagine government had said, "We'll write the check for the 10 billion dollars of tuition revenue that it takes to sustain Canadian universities for one year. Everyone who's enrolled next year can go for free. We want universities to increase enrollment by 10 percent, and you know to reopen applications and in exchange for underwriting you for this year, we want you to put some content online. We want mm. you to have some share of what you do in the public domain. We could have really kickstarted uh, kind of online learning for everybody mm. around who wanted it across Canada. But we mm. missed that opportunity, right? So I think we just have to think about what, what kind of remaining low-hanging fruit there is and mm -hmm. hopefully to have some policy creativity and seize it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, a pessimistic note, and then followed by an optimistic note. I, I like that, Peter. Okay. <laughs> um, one one last question, and then we're gonna. Uh, well, that, that'll be all the time we've got. Um, but it's about kind of capitalizing on your optimism here, if we can, for a second. And you know, given the the degree of um, of, of worry that's out there as people are watching the rise of, of AI and automation in their workplaces. Um, how can we kind of reframe that and uh, put it in a, in a more positive light? And is there maybe a way of uh, presenting this to workers that uh, emphasizes the opportunities that they might be able, they might stand to gain from it? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that what you have to do is to take it away from the general and, and move it to the specific, you have to let people see what the actual benefits of some technology are going to be in their in their workplace or in the in the um, uh, in whatever setting they're in, right. And there are some very good emerging kind of ethnographies about what it looks like when you bring robots into the workplace, and it's not all bad, right. And there's been some automation, in, in, even in my field, and, and boy, it's great, right. Some of the things you can do now, that you couldn't do before text to data and machine learning and, and, and ways that we can learn faster are, are really incredible. So I think that what we have to do is just is, you know, respect that people are going to be fearful of things, hopefully be able to give them demonstrations of how these things can improve their well being and then, you know, ho hope that they that they go for it. But the other is, like, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You're going to have dislocation, you're going to have disruption. So you better have a system 
and this is this is the problem this is the the domain of government you better have a system that's going to help people through those transitions fairly compassionately with maybe even a little bit of empathy which is something we've had a lot of in government lately mm -hmm. and it's been great but in a way that recognizes that some people are going to pay short-term costs for us to have greater efficiency and and and, and uh and greater onlining of these things and mm -hmm. we should treat them with dignity mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. That's kind of the uh, underlying theme of, of our brave new work here is, you know, change is coming. Change is not bad in and of itself. Let's take take the good with the bad and try and uh, figure out a way to bring everyone along with us and, and not leave anyone behind. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we've got for you uh, today, Peter, but I want to thank you so much for sharing your research with us and for being part of Brave New Work since 2018. Uh, we really appreciate it. I, I just love the opportunity to be here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Peter.